So I'd like to open up uh, a hearing set for 7 p.m. site plan approval uh, amendment to add a new parking lot behind Bell Hall and 20% reduction in parking for Fire School at 47 Round Hill Road, Northampton, map ID 31B-64. And the applicant has requested that you're going to rescind without prejudice. Right. Well, no, we'd actually like to withdraw without prejudice so we can reapply probably three months from now. So the, the without prejudice means they can bring it back to any time. So uh, I'm not sure if there's anything to discuss. We don't have to hear from the public or anything? They're rescinding the, they're rescinding the, there's no hearing. Okay, so, so. Can we vote on it or is it there? So that's what we're going to vote. So I move that we allow them to withdraw without prejudice. I second. second. All right, Paul, okay. Okay. All right, thank you very much. I'll start. See you in a couple months. Have we ever not allowed them to rescind <laughs> that was, That's why I came here. Though. I was like, what if they say no? Yeah. Yeah. How can you force them to do it? You're tempted, aren't you? Yeah, I know, I know. Just for fun. Yeah, all right. fun so, um, just, um, we're kind of getting off to a little bit of a ragtag start, but because our next hearing is not until 725, um, when we, uh, so we can't start that one. So there's a couple of things I think we should talk about between now and 725. Um, one is we can do the minutes. Uh, so if you want to uh, do the approval of the minutes. I move that we approve the minutes. Is there a second? Second. Any comments or typos or anything on the minutes? Um, oh, I have a typo, I thought. Okay, okay, I read them. Yeah, I read them. <laughs> I read them. <laughs>
what you're doing is sort of wrapping up the final permits for this, that part of the project. And then once those permits are issued, then construction can start on that side. So can you provide us with whatever document goes into what workforce housing means, like how it's defined, so we can make sure that they're defending so much enough with what the intention is? Um, I can. It, it's not been codified. I mean, the idea actually behind these lots were that, and, and through the subdivision, you approved a subdivision that showed smaller lots. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the, the idea was that um, the lots, because they were so small, would necessarily dictate potentially the end the cost of the product. But, but yes, there's a lot of discussion about how it was important yeah. to, um, um, to do that. So there, isn't a, there wasn't a number put down. Mm -hmm. But I think what, um, the other piece, the other thing that's referred to is, is the um, small A, affordable, if you will. But it's not the, the, the affordable right. under zoning, um, affordable housing is meeting the requirements of people who are at 80% or below the median income. And so we typically talk about um, this sort of market rate affordable or workforce affordable as being 80% to 120% of the area median income. So it's affordable to those folks who are making 80%. So what would that, sorry, okay. no. what would that, do you, do you have a number for that for the Northampton? Does anyone crunch that number? We do have the number. I don't have it on me, but I, I think we could get it. Okay. Because we just take the area median income and um, you don't know for a family of three or four. You don't know what the area median income is. And no, because it changes. You know. Um, so I, I haven't. I don't keep. I don't track it so that I have it off the top of my head. And we can extrapolate what what the house what what the rate. Sorry, what they would have to charge for the house. You know, what what that person could afford. Right. What makes it like workforce housing? Yeah. Now the other thing to remember is all of these, and I, I don't. Uh, you can look at the applications and s see this, but generally at the state hospital, the whole idea is to make many, at least the standard is at minimum Energy Star, and then be, it goes beyond that. So, for instance, the Olander houses were um, all different variant gradations of LEED certified or potentially be certified. So what that translates into is lower cost, um, maintenance costs for the homeowner. So it's not necessarily that you can look at a $300,000 house mm -hmm. there and compare it to a $300,000 house anywhere else in town, like an old Victorian, because the, the maintenance and the, the operating costs for that house are much higher than the energy efficient houses. So. Um, we had asked them to put um, a figure together to show the difference. You know, if I'm paying $250 a month on another house that's not Energy Star, you know, that, that money can be put into slightly higher cost on the front end. But isn't it really about people being able to get a mortgage, right? I mean, based on their income. So even if they, there's savings on the back end, you have to be able to afford to buy it first to get a mortgage. Right, and one of the things I know that at a staff level we have been talking to Mass Development about is um, um, working with the banks, local banks, mm -hmm. to talk about that issue and talk about how uh, how to try to compare, you know, a high energy efficient home to a mortgage for a home that's not energy efficient yeah. and. I think they have gotten agreements, or and it may have gone to the developer level, it may not have been mass developed, but I know the conversation has been had with a couple of the local banks to say, okay, we can we can extend a mortgage at you know um, X down payment or whatever or X income level um, beyond what we might normally do because of the energy. Oh, that's correct. Okay, so it, it could, but it could mean that the person that has to spend two or three hundred dollars less per month on just on heat. Right. Which would mean that they could pay a higher mortgage payment, make a higher mortgage payment. Right, but that on the front end, the bank has to recognize that. To be yes. Yeah, the bank has to recognize that. The bank has to recognize that. Well, if Carolyn's saying that they're willing to, right? Yeah. Local banks. Yeah, we've heard, we've gotten, that this is going back 
probably a year now, so I'm hoping it still stands. Mm -hmm. But I know that those conversations were um, beginning with, with some of the local banks without more. Cool. Yep. Yeah. Um, since the original sort of conceptual plan was before my time, will the developer sort of bring that up and I can see what we generally agreed to and then look at the specifics of what they're asking? In other words, you know. Well, you can have, we can have, I can provide you with a map, but it just showed this area as uh, with just blocks. Yeah. And would we expect a staff report from you that says it looks like to me these yeah. plans are consistent? Okay. Sure. So, for mass development, then it'll be, we'll get mass development as well as an amendment to the site plan, to the, the, the subdivision permit. And we'll have the build, do you know who the builder is? P-E-C-O-Y. We'll be coming with a site plan for these, I think there's like 28 lots, I can't remember the number. 24. 24? 24 lots. Um, and that's on the, so was that, that's, that's the thing? That's the 22nd, and then the right builder plots also. Oh, we're doing right builders that night yeah. as well. So right builders will be coming in. That's the second half of the permit we just do with mass development to do the new houses, the six new houses. In that and then I'm hoping also for them to have <coughs> the residential zoning, um, whether or not you can get to it. But I, you know, each meeting is my goal to get in a zone. Some zoning. Yeah. Brandy, did you have a, want to talk about the CSC meeting that you were at? Is there anything? Well, well, they mostly it was about the presentation of the proposed new master plan drawing. It was the conceptual. Um, what they're targeting right now is this, the center part there. Their proposals would be to the west of the new right builder's proposal and to the west of uh, Birch Park or whatever they call it. In that area south of south of uh, South of Fort Cross, that part. Um, and there was considerable discussion, and we heard from a lot of the neighbors and uh, abutters of the project, and also um, people that live in the project. And the conceptual plan threw a bunch of houses up in the northern part with an arbitrary square footage. There were 5,000 square feet in the bungalows, so they made them twice that. They made them 10,000 square feet up above. Is this the plan that showed that has a huge loop road that just has a hammerhead at the end? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, huge. Well, it's just it's a, yeah. it's a long yeah. dead end that, with a hammerhead at the end. Yeah, it, it, but it cuts down on the number of roads that we're going to go. It, it involves elimination of the northern employee home. Uh, moving of the memorial to where the fountain used to be near the Birch Park. Um, it, it has the coal housing over there on the upper left side. Um, but all of these these lots, maybe that's where the 24 came. Anyway, there were there are lots up there, and they're all 10,000 square feet, which is bigger than the lots. On Olander Drive, where all the nice market rate houses are, and I, a lot of people took exception to that. And she said, "Well, it's just conceptual." Blah, blah, blah. Uh, she wanted it in there so that she could market the center market the center place, um, and it was one of those, you know, trust me, it'll be whatever market dictates kind of. Are they going to uh, anyway, she wouldn't. Um, she didn't. She would not offer to uh, redraw that with more housing in there. The overall density, or at least if they build out according to the new master plan, there's only 251. Of them. And there's a ceiling of 337. And the previous um, master plan had. Uh, I don't know, some, 30 some more than that. So I mean, I thought it was a drastic reduction in density, of, of well over 10 percent. Well, especially because the last master plan up to density from 200 to 300. Well, no, the master plan had a ceiling on there, but the, the conceptual plan only had 
So is she going to bring it to us on the 23rd? Or you guys going to approve it? Did you approve? Did the CAC approve it? CAC approved it. I voted against it. On the principal, uh, Eric voted against it, and Martha voted against it. Yeah, you all don't need. I mean, there, the CAC has a very general role. They probably didn't even need to vote on the change except for the removal of that building, um, because it, that's the only part that's concrete up there. The existing. Um, everything else on the concept plan is just um, representing oh, there's going to be some roads and, ha and house lots. So when the CAC approves the master plan, they're not approving roads, road location, houses, or anything like that. So what happens is that you all then would approve on a segment by segment basis the build out. Um, and you have to make the determination that's consistent with the concept of the special permit and the, the Village Hill provisions of creating a mix, um, mix of units, a mix of unit types, um, densities, and so forth that meet the concept of the village. So they're planning on taking down the male attendant building now? No, not the male attendant the northern. Northern employees. Yeah, the one that's way out in back. That one. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah the male tennis building is one of the big columns. Though. Right. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. But to go further, Beth said that we didn't really have to vote on the demolition of Northern employees building because they hadn't really agreed to retain it. They were just going to try and retain it. Right. So it was just. You know, it was a suggestion. It was a concept. <laughs> well, it was, it essentially, it was a bone that they, that Mass Development threw at the city because of all the T buildings and all the other buildings that were originally going to be. They determined it couldn't be preserved, so then they said, well, let's try to, maybe we can find another building we can potentially preserve, and this one looks like a good one. So, the, a lot of, some people objected to the three hundred dollars to $350,000 price on the bungalows. They can call them bungalows, I guess, over in the West I like Park. that. Um, and uh, Rutherford Platt spoke about the need for a community center. Um, one woman spent quite a few minutes complaining about lack of open space up there. I had to laugh. <laughs> uh, anyway, she wants a park in the middle of the north there. That's about it. Yeah, he's getting kind of congested up there. Uh, all right, we got two minutes before we got to do the hearing. Um, do you want to do the Turkey Hill? Turkey Hill. Yeah. Oh, Turkey Hill. Yep. You want us to do a quick thing on that? So, um, I don't know if you've been following it, but this is um, the request for discontinuance of the road is uh, up here, uh, is for the tail end of Turkey Hill Road um, that long ago was allocated as a public way, essentially, in the now what's now the Turkey Hill Conservation Area. So it was that dirt, um, steep, um, Jeep Road, essentially, where the, um, the uh, gravel pit was, and that um, a few years ago the planning board um, approved as part of conservation of those that hundreds of acres of conservation area going to the West Hampton line. Does that road go? The road we're talking about is the one that goes to the West Hampton line. Right, road. It theoretically continues on. I mean, on. it's a it's a road path that goes all the way to the West Hampton. Where's the Skibiski property? No. It's at the end. It's on the West Hampton. I mean, it's it goes. Actually, I think it partially goes into West Hampton. I can pull up the maps for sure. But um, it's uh, further west along there. Well, this, but the, this continuing this road cut out the access to the property. Um, well, I think. Let me just pull up a second. I'm gonna pull up this document. Do we need to 
vote on this? Yeah, so what happens is you vote to recommend discontinuance and then it goes to city council. Um, and or to not recommend. What's that? Or to not recommend. Correct. Right. Uh, <laughs> that, um, there's an access easement that will remain. It says, so the, 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 the official language for discontinuance says acknowledges an existing right of way for WT Cowles and their successors and in interest to use Turkey Hill Road as an access easement um, shown on the plan, um, which will be part of this, which hasn't quite been pulled together, but before it goes to the DPW or Board of Public Works, that plan will be in place. Um, and that easement will not go away with the discontinuance. It's just saying that this is it's not going to be a public road. Anymore. I move that we recommend this to the city council. Um, oh, oh, wait, wait for a second. Yeah. Give me one second. Oh, oh, I wanted to discuss yeah. that before we. Well, oh, no, you no, 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 now you can discuss yeah. it. Yeah. Um, are, there, are there going to be any impacts on public access along this road? Because I'm, I'm actually morally, ethically opposed to, like, Privatizing public ways. This is this section goes in between the city owned conservation land. So it's all public. It's all, I mean, people use this now as a walking path. The idea is it's not to be a vehicular passage. But it will be perfect, it will still be public land. It's or? part of it's the city. Uh, this is part of that huge deal that the city um, was able to negotiate with Jadron and other property owners to purchase this section of the Mineral Hills. Um, conservation area that essentially goes to West Hampton. And so this um, bisects the two pieces. And so it's really just saying this is no longer a, a vehicular road, but it is absolutely a trail that's being used to access the conservation land as public. So, uh, yeah, so there's a parking lot down below at the end of yeah, the paved section. There. Yeah. And it's everything basically beyond that is, is a walking trail. Yeah. So there's no impacts on public access, it's still... Right, and the issue is, you know, when you have a public way, there's an assumption that then you have legal rights for frontage and development. I mean, you can't do it until you file a subdivision and build the road to standard. But since that will never happen because now it's all conservation land, there's no need to have it listed as a Okay, so it's not some attempt to prevent development. No, no, no. Okay. Well, I was just going to say, I, this, this land has been conserved with a, a CPA, CPA grants, and that there was a complaint about, um, I don't know, snowmobiles, trucks, all sorts of things going up there and getting into the conservation land. And I think the hope is it would be you know, when it cuts down on vehicular traffic, right. it will make a big difference in the No, I just, wanted, I just wanted to be clear on what the purpose of this was. Yeah, no, it's all public access. Yeah. Okay. Is anybody here from the public to talk about Turkey Hill Road? And who made the motion? Sorry. Uh, I made the motion. Randy and Jen Sykes. Mm -hmm. All right, um, all in favor? Uh, so I'd like to open up a hearing scheduled for 725, special permit for construction of ground-mounted solar array up to 200% of base parcel demand, demand at 311 Chesterfield Road, Leeds, map ID 15B-32, as advertised on February 23rd and March 1st. So the applicant here? Yep. Good evening. Uh, my name is Pat Melnick. My daughter Mary has a mistake that she'd like to put in the computer. Um, pull out the keyboard. No, no, no. Pull out the key slide okay. out the keyboard. And at the back of the keyboard, there's a USB port. No, on the, well, in the there port. Is. Oh, yes. It's actually on the top of the keyboard. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, actually, to guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then you can just drag it back. Yeah. Fishing trips? No, it's just that was just something that was awesome. Well, they're getting this um, 
of just a Carolyn, the reason we're seeing this as a special permit is because the capacity is 200 percent of what's needed by the use. It's more, more than, than more than more than what's um, so if it, it would be considered accessory, it was just put to serve the principal structure. But since the capacity will allow for excess um, energy to sell back to the utility, right? That's what it's going to be. And it, it being in a residential district, so essentially, you know, income from in a residential district. But we decided to allow all this when we did the zoning. Right. You decided to set up a special permit process for it, yeah. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah, uh, my name is Pat Nolnick. I live at 311 Chesterfield Road uh, with my wife and uh, sometimes my family members. Uh, I have proposed, and I think I understand from the zoning ordinance that, it, that, that any ground mount solar system, whether it's 200% or 100%, doesn't matter. Any ground mount system needs a special permit under the ordinance, and all, all zoning districts has nothing to do with the capacity of the system. Uh, but in any event, uh, I am asking it to be ground mounted for uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, I do want uh, to have up to 200% of capacity uh, because I want to provide for the needs of my house, which is about 15.4 15, uh, 15, uh, uh, kilowatts uh, per year, and I've given you the documentation for that. And also I have an office in, in Northampton, which I hope to use the excess capacity to provide for the uh, office use and also any excess would be available to my family for their own uh, metering system. Uh, so in a sense, uh, I want to provide uh, not only just for my house, uh, but for everything that I have uh, uh, hands on that uh, needs electricity uh, uh, to avoid uh, lots of reasons uh, to do it, but uh, they're all good ones, I think. Uh, in any event, uh, I propose to put the solar array in the pasture area of my house. That. And I gave you a, uh, a plan, uh, which is on the board. It's actually a survey plan that was done on my property, or at least a portion of my property. And the handwritten stuff, of course, is done by me. It's not particularly perfect, but I think it does comply with the site plan criteria. Uh, the measurements were done by me. Uh, but in particular, if you look to the, to the east uh, of the property, there's a pasture, an open pasture. And if you go up Chesterfield Road, it's a very obvious uh, uh, open area that uh, is like an icon, I think, for people traveling up Chesterfield Road. And the portion of the pasture that I own uh, abuts my neighbor, uh, Mo and uh, Janet Mott. And they have horses in the pasture, and I have a small garden area in the bottom of the pasture, but I basically allow them to use the whole pasture for uh, uh, the horses, basically horse pasture. So if you look at the area to the north of the pasture area, uh, it abuts a stone wall uh, that is basically the confines for the horses. Uh, and I propose to put the solar array uh, in the uh, south side of the wall, uh, but up to near the wall, uh, but in the lower side of the pasture. Uh, the reason for this is there is a pole, uh, a utility pole, uh, to the south of the site, uh, right on the road. And it's the driest and best uh, open area I have on my property to allow for such a, uh, an array. And uh, it's the best place in my property to do it. I have a large, uh, lot of my land, a lot of it's wooded, and a lot of it's unsuitable. And this seems to be the most suitable site. And the system, as you can see, is going to be about 45 feet uh, by 90 feet uh, maximum. It's going to have two sets of panels, which we'll get to shortly. Uh, it's 100 feet away from the north line. Our setback requirements are 50 feet. I'm 100 feet there. Uh, from the south line, I'm about 200 feet. Uh, so the setbacks uh, are met there. And I propose to put on the east, a 50-foot setback was the minimal setback. Although my neighbor, Mo, asked me, uh, he didn't care where he put it. He didn't care if it was right on his uh, property line. But anyhow, we have to comply with zoning, so I'm going to put it 50 feet away from there. My proposal is to uh, uh, the uh, to the north of this uh, stone wall. Everything is already a treed area; it's uh, heavily wooded, and uh, I plan to leave that alone. Uh, to the to the along Chesterfield Road, there's already some trees along the road, which I'd leave for screening and buffer. I don't propose to put any more screening and buffer because it is a uh, icon, I guess I'd say. It's it's a place I think people enjoy viewing. I don't think uh, obscuring the view would uh, benefit anyone. Uh, to the west, there's more heavily woods, but I'm the only one affected to the west. 
My house, as you can see, is about a thousand feet away from the site. And between my house and the pasture, it's uh, basically wooded and uh, uh, some open, but it's mostly wooded. Uh, so I'm the only one affected there. To the east is my neighbor Mo. He's, his house is actually o over a thousand feet away from the solar array. Uh, in the pasture, there's other trees, and for lots of reasons, Mo doesn't want any screening on that side, uh, particularly because screening would affect the ability of the horses to pasture. Uh, so essentially, what I want to do is leave it. Leave the site conditions just the way they are. Uh, no change in the site, no change in topography, uh, no change in uh, physical characteristics. Just put the solar array in an existing uh, open uh, area. Uh, panels will look like this. Uh, there, uh, we have Mr. Richard Hahn from Hyperion, which are the contractors I uh, hope to have install this site. Uh, they're a little bit unique. Mr. Hahn will explain the uh, way the solar uh, panels are installed. Uh, from his company, uh, but essentially they're elevated about seven feet off the ground, and they're not anchored in concrete. Uh, they're basically uh, uh, non-disruptive poles that are driven into the ground. Uh, the poles are steel, and they just uh, uh, self-anchor. And Mr. Hahn will explain to you how that how that works. Uh, so there are very very little uh, site disturbance. Uh, the only I guess disturbance is a visual one, and depending upon your point of view, they're either beautiful or they're not. But I tend to think they're beautiful, and I don't think they'll uh, be anything more than uh, an asset and a benefit to the, to the viewscape. Uh, there'll be some shading to the rear, but of course the south side of the site is where we want the sun. And, uh, they basically face the south uh, to the sun. Uh, I did give you a general topography of the area on my uh, uh, USGS map. We're basically on a sloped hill. I'm on the lower part of a sloped hill, but uh, they've done the metering and uh, they believe that the uh, uh, solar capacity here is good, very good, and uh, this is one of the two uh, parts of my property that was suitable. This, this is the most suitable. Uh, panels from the ground, as you can see, they're anchored underground, uh, straight into the ground, above the ground. Uh, they are uh, elevated, and the panels can be tipped somewhat uh, so that in the summer you can get a, actually a better uh, uh, solar capacity and in the winter you can tip them back so they uh, face the sun more so they have a, a little bit of angulation they're not entirely fixed you have to uh, do some uh, mechanical uh, switching on your own with the uh, wrenches but they can be they can be tipped this is the pasture as you can see as I told you Mr. Mo, uh, Mo and Janet are to the east so that's to the lower side of your screen uh, there's about a thousand feet of open pasture it's a huge pasture I don't know if you can see the, uh, they have a, uh, so the, uh, they have like a, a horse uh, enclosure there where they uh, ride the horses or they train the horses. And his house is actually off site, it's so far away. Uh, but you can see to the, to the north, if you can see a little bit, there are some apple trees there. They're basically crab apples that we just let grow there. Uh, they're going to remain, uh, most of them are going to remain. And uh, they will give some visual buffer uh, from the road, uh, although I don't want to change that much. And as you can see towards Mr. Mott, there is already some visual buffer for him. Uh, but Mo has told me he doesn't want anything more than that either. <coughs> and for a thousand feet away, and he'll be looking at him from a side slot. I don't think he'll have any uh, uh, visual. Well, he, he doesn't care. He's happy to have him. Let's put it that way. Uh, this is a little bigger, uh, I guess, more expanded view. You can see the panels in the more or less upper center of the site. You can see a better view of the pasture, and you can kind of get a better uh, feel for the screening and buffering around it uh, a little bit, hope, as best I can do. And uh, essentially, go to the next one, I guess. This is where I'd like Mr. Hahn to uh, make some comments if he could. Uh, so, to the board uh, at this point. Hi. As, uh, is it, as, is it right? is it? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. As Pat mentioned, I'm Richard Hahn. I'm uh, with Hyperion Systems. We're an uh, Amherst, uh, Massachusetts-based company. Uh, our uh, our business is uh, is building solar arrays primarily over uh, is existing farmland uh, without taking the farm out of production. So what we want to do is we want to preserve the land and still be able to generate uh, uh, any basically any amount of power over that land uh, and, and like I said and still uh, still preserve the, the local ecosystem. Uh, the quality, the, um, the characteristics of our of our system, uh, we're low impact. We don't use concrete, as Pat mentioned. 
Uh, what we do is we, uh, we vibrate a pole into the ground. The, the poles are about uh, four and a half inches out, uh, outside diameter, uh, and they have fins on them. Okay? Uh, the fins provide the, the correct coefficient of friction so that uh, we can withstand you know, over 100 mile an hour wind, wind speed. Okay? So that meets building code in, in uh, most, if not all, of western Massachusetts. Uh, we are dual use, uh, as, uh, as, as we've mentioned. Uh, we want to be over farmland, so pasture land, crop, uh, it really doesn't matter. Uh, we, can, uh, we can still preserve the farm. The farm you know, keeps doing everything that they were doing before we, uh, we put the, the solar array up. And then we're, uh, the, the system itself is flexible. So if, uh, uh, say, a farmer uh, wants to grow a, uh, a crop that's particularly shade tolerant one year, decides to, to switch out the crop to become uh, more, uh, uh, more uh, you know, uh, 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 requires more sunlight, we can actually take panels off, okay, and, and slide the panels across the, uh, across the spline there. This system is patent pending, okay. There's not anybody else in the, in the United States that we know of, if not the world, who are actually putting up farm, uh, solar rays over farm and still keeping the, the the, uh, the farm in production. Okay? Uh, just one. Uh -huh. um, from the application, uh, they're 35 feet tall. 35? That's what it says. Uh, no, they're, uh, so there are three measurements. If I can, let me just go back. The reason I asked is that must be a typo. I, I did the application. I don't remember. Uh, you know, they're, they're, yeah, it says 35 feet. Yeah, because in that area, zoning only allows 20 feet. If I could, the, the, the measurements on here, the, um, and I apologize for the, uh, for the perhaps poor quality of the, of the, uh, the diagram. Uh, along the back row, you're going to see 7, 12, and then 15. Oh, so okay. seven, it's 7 foot to the uh, bottom of the panels when yeah. they're tilted at 30 degrees. Uh, it's about uh, 11, 12 feet to the spline that, go, that runs across the, uh, the, the, the row and then 15 feet uh, off the ground when the panel is at 30 degrees. So it might go up to 16 or 17 feet if you tilt it, but not. That, that's probably about as, as tall as it's going to get. Fred, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, how are you going to get the power out to the power company, and where are the inverters and stuff? Actually, what we're going to do on this one, I believe we're looking at micro-inverters, so they'd be actually on the back of the panel. Uh, if we need to put an inverter, you know, on the ground, we'd have to pour just a small concrete pad, not much bigger than that, to uh, to, to mount it. Uh, as Pat mentioned, there is a there's a utility uh, pole that's uh, up at the north, sorry, the south oh, sorry. south end of the uh, of the pasture. So it's uphill a little bit. But Are you not go underground. Yeah, we would trench that. Okay. Can, uh, we want to make that. Well, I think we, what we, when we looked at this, ledge is uh, below, uh, is lower than eight feet, okay? And we, we only needed... You've done some test drills that have been I believe they have. Um, I, I can't speak authoritatively but what we have. But hitting rock does you up. A little bit. <laughs> okay. Um, so, we, you know, again, with most, of the, um, uh, with most of the farms, most of the pastures around here, uh, we, we do look for ledge-free property. So if, if you do hit rock and you have to move it, do they have to come back to us or as long as they stay within the zone? As long as they stay within the setback. I mean, you, you would be approving the installation of the panels and they were showing compliance with the zone setback. So um, unless there would be, unless there's an issue that you all discussed that's relevant to setback from the road or screening from the road and significant changes to the location affect uh, your decision, but if, if that's not the case, then we can allow them that anyway. Go ahead. Yeah, they're talking about the crowd of the fact they're not putting concrete in, but I don't think we really care if they do. Uh, right, but just if they hit something, they're probably going to move it. I don't know what the, based on what we put in the permit, if they have to move it, 
as long as they stay within the setback, it's going to be fine. Right. Um, we, uh, we developed our system in conjunction with the University of Massachusetts uh, um, uh, Department of Agriculture, um, or Agricultural School. Uh, and it has been in the, uh, in the field at the Agriculture Experiment Station at South Deerfield. What, they've, uh, what we installed was 17 kilowatts, uh, and it's been up and running for the past year uh, uh, at, the, uh, at the farm. Uh, uh, absolutely uh, ran perfectly uh, over the past year. As a matter of fact, uh, what they found was uh, the grass underneath the, uh, 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 underneath the panels actually held up in the summer a lot better because of the shading. Uh, and, and quite frankly, you can see the uh, the the, uh, the cows up there. They uh, they they love the shade out there in uh, in August. Um, we haven't uh, we haven't put crops under it uh, under this one, but I understand that that's uh, that's what's going to happen uh, this year. This is a little bit different configuration in that these are only three panels per cluster. Uh, the the subsequent systems that we've installed are all four panels per cluster. So these these stand about uh, eight and a half feet off the ground at their uh, at the lowest at the lowest point. Okay, we do uh, we do uh, vast majority of our construction with bobcats. Okay, so we are not uh, we are not impacting the farm at all. Uh, a larger project that we've uh, we've recently installed is uh, the Edwards Farm in Hadley. Uh, this is a hundred kilowatts. Um, we uh, we have uh, have installed everything, and we're basically awaiting the interconnection at this point. Um, so it's uh, it's gone through the winter, not much of a winter this year, um, uh, but you know, snow uh, s snow does not affect uh, our, our panels at all. Okay. There we go. I I think we're good. Any questions from the board? The zoning is 20 feet, yeah, right. so they couldn't build there for 20 feet. Thanks, we can see if anybody from the public wants to speak. Is anybody here from the public would like to speak? Sir? Joe? Hello, I, hello. Joseph Mr. 312 Justville Road. Uh, I think the project's fine. In fact, I was talking to Pat, and he had an alternate location, which uh, I prefer this one much better. But the reason I'm, so I guess I'm in favor of the project. But the reason I, I'd like to speak is I'm still not quite sure why you need a special permit. You, it's not because it's 200 percent. And Pat was saying it's because you need a special permit for any solar array? Ground mount. Just ground mount. Any solar ground mount. Okay, so if you're putting it on your roof, you wouldn't need a special permit. If you're putting it on your roof, you wouldn't need a special permit. There's some districts that it, it doesn't require a special permit, so it's not all special permit across the board. It's a different situation. Because it's a residential district and you're creating more um, power than your need on your site, then that's what triggers a special permit. Okay, I'm, I'm still not clear why, why you need a special think, permit. But think I, of it as he's becoming an industry. He's, he's generating more than he needs. So it's a business in a residential area. Okay. Are you but, curious but, about what the zoning is or about the reasoning for the zoning? Uh, I'm, I'm curious about the reasoning why someone would need a special permit for it. Uh, because I was under the impression when I received the public notice, and that's why I'm here, it said like the 200%. And I was thinking, it, oh, because it's the 200%. But then in the previous discussion, you said, no, it's not the 200% because it's ground mounted. Yeah, it's up to 200 percent in it um, for in residential districts. It's not. It's not for every district because in the business district, um, it, you know, again, as it was mentioned, it's sort of like you're become, you're generating um, business income essentially from a residential property. Well, the 200 percent is not. Not the. That's the limit that they can. That's use. the limit. Right. That's not. That's not what triggers. The requirement. It's, it's, that's the maximum that needs. Oh, it's the maximum. Okay. The, the, the wording that you had was uh, for rural residential accessory solar installations that produce more than the needs of the principal use on the site, and up to 200 percent of that requires special permit. Okay. In other words, you don't get a special permit if it's over 200 percent. You don't get a permit at all. Okay. Oh, it's not permitted at all if it's over 200 percent. Okay. 
the risk. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? I move we close the public meeting. Second. All in favor? All right. So, um, public hearing is closed. The uh, two issues we had were uh, the top panels may not exceed 20 feet, which we've heard that they do not, and the maximum kilowatt per, per minute is 30. So those are the only issues we had. And then the trenching? Oh, right, yeah, the, the trenching for the underground, the underground for the, the wiring. Any other questions or comments? Who wants to make the motion? I do. I move we approve a special permit for construction of ground mounted solar array up to 200% of the base parcel demand at 311 Chesterfield Road, Leeds, BAP ID 15B32. Second. Second. Uh, any other discussion? All, right, all in favor? All right. Thank you. Thank you. So we have 10 minutes till. Uh, the next permit uh, hearing. I just wonder what this discussion is on. Oh, that's Carolyn's placeholder for her. always wanting us to talk about something. <laughs> 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 John, think of the He's really pleased, yeah. He really likes the second plan. Yeah. It seemed like the way they were going was there isn't enough room for a bike track. Right, that seems really clear. Right, and so, yeah. and, then, and then the bulk of the discussion was the sidewalks on both sides. Yeah, right. right. And it seems like what they're going to try to come with is put them on both sides. Nine minutes to go. Right. 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 Right.
he thinks that would cause the issue. Because it would, it, what it would do is allow, you know how oftentimes the traffic is backed up just because somebody did it through the lab? And it can't be five seconds later. Or those who are going to be the last one that would have been 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 the last one. Because they're, they're saying they recognize that the other people would say this, but we're trying to make it really affect the I think that's right. I think that's right. Because you know what? It's the problem. But I think what 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 I think Yeah. 
but there was, legally there seemed to be a lot of noise surrounding it as far as access and yeah. from the back, from the side, who owned what. Right, I mean, it abuts the pop, I mean, it abuts the pop's yeah. parking lot, which yeah. probably isn't or, ideal. And, but people come in from the back or to the right of the pop's and in the back of the building, but nobody really knows what's going on. So it's a title issue. Yeah. 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 So you're not fine. But living next to the road could be awesome. Or it's awesome. You should have bought the house next to us. Sixteen or But that, I mean, it was very cheap, but it is. Yeah, it's very pale yellow. It's right where Lindsay comes in. It's right across the London Street. Oh. No, that's not this one. I'll keep my eyes open. So those signs are like Linden. It's gorgeous. It's such a nice idea. Union. Oh, he told me you're alive. We have one. We have a beautiful one. Okay, uh, good evening. My name is Brian Balicki, a professional engineer with Sage Engineering. Just for a refresher, we have two projects combined tonight, which is the Digital Linda Manor and the Zoe Senior Life. Since our last hearing back in January, um, we've revised both the site plans, the Zoe one quite significantly, based on comments we received from both the neighbors and the board. Um, we presented these revised plans to the immediate neighbors last Tuesday night. And this afternoon, I received the DPW sign off on the stormwater permit. The, uh, the most significant changes to Linda Manor um, we added notes all over the plans that restrict all lighting must be brought up to current zoning conformance and downcast light fixtures with much lower foot candle ratings to meet current zoning regulations. 
And as was suggested by the board, we added a couple more shade trees throughout the new parking areas. Um, that was really about it. That was revised for the addition. Um, same layout. There was just more trees added throughout this stretch here. If there's any questions on the addition, I'll answer those now or I can keep moving and save them all to the end. Um, the, the only question, the lighting, are you guys going to change any of the existing poles or you're, this is only... My understanding was that's what was requested right. and that, that's agreeable to, right. to fix all the fixtures. Right. It may not be the actual poles, but the fixtures would need to be adjusted. Yeah. So for the Zoe Senior Project, um, based on comments received at the last meeting, there was we basically redesigned the entire site. Um, the driveway, the direct driveway to Route 9 was removed. Um, it now shares a common driveway with Linda Manor. The parking was moved from the west side of the facility to the far east side. We moved the building and all the parking and driveways and everything associated with it to the northeast about 20 feet. We mirrored the building, which included all the parking lots, the employee access, and that also accomplished bringing the one-story section of the facility closer to both the street and the closest to budding houses. We suggested that the sidewalks be removed from that side of Route 9 and put to the west side of Route 9. And all of this basically it increased the perimeter buffers quite substantially and allowed us to redesign the landscaping completely. Um, I'll let David Payne touch on that as we go a little further. But those are the major sticking points. This is the revised layout. So as we can see on the far east side, all the parking has been completely removed and brought to this corner. The driveway is no longer collected to Route 9. The this portion of the facility right here is one story, which effectively gives them an extra 30 feet of screening from the true building height. You can, I try to put an overlay together which shows the old versus the new um, to give an idea of what really changed. And the most significant changes were this was the old parking lot here and the old access drive along the south line in the background. And then the old building is just the dark line of where the building was before. So everything was brought up as tight to the Linda Manor site as it could, could possibly make it fit. And all the parking lot is, is now screened from these two neighbors on this side. Um, just just some, some highlights of what the changes brought. Um, around the Grunwald property, which is the closest direct household, we specify in the plans that there's a 20-foot buffer zone that's not touched. All the existing trees will remain. Once outside of that buffer, we have proposed an additional landscaping buffer and a new fence. And by flipping the parking lot, the closest from her property line to a parking facility moved from 20 to 75 feet. And the setback from her property line to the four-story building went from 110 to 147 feet. Three stories. Sorry. Brain fart, excuse me. Three-story facility. Oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. Three-story facility always has been, always will be. Um, the Beerware property, direct south of Butter, the driveway was originally about 15 feet from their property line. It's been increased to 36 to 40 feet. And the building was ultimately moved about 18 feet from their property line. And if I go back to my overall plan here. The other benefit to the two neighbors on the west is by removing the parking on this side, there's no true traffic flow in this section of the road. It's only for emergency vehicles. Um, the traffic pattern is through the, the rotary into the majority of the parking and then out back to the service entrance and back out to the front. So there should be no vehicle traffic on this whole section.
that's my quick update on the changes. Um, can take any questions or we can keep moving. Can you go back, just go back to the, the point for a second? Um, so it looks like also you've added fencing, a new fence around, the, uh, I'm going to mispronounce the last name, Grunewald. There was originally a fence shown, but it was much closer to the property. Right. Um, we extended the fence on both sides of the, the property line, and it's continued to be there. It's just gotten further from her property. Okay. Um, and also, is there going to be one on the, the, the property north, uh, the Ryan, Margaret Ryan? Right now, there's a proposed um, six-foot privacy fence yep. out on, on the project side of the, the screening. Yep. And then, um, as suggested by Kalen, we consider putting a fence down this property line as well. Um, that was a discussion point with the neighbors the other evening. Um, we're more than happy to put whatever type of fence they want, but it was did they have they did the, did the neighbor ask for the fence or did you guys just start talking about the fence? It's on it's just it's on the plan. Right, and that was uh, one of the things uh, I, I think I'll let Mary Ann speak to it, but one of the issues she raised was about wildlife and as you know when you fence yourself completely in you eliminate it. So Whatever fence she wants, if she wanted a split rail down the road and this privacy fence on the other side, if she wanted some unfenced because that whole area between the trains and uh, the Grunwalls uh, is open space now, so maybe she doesn't want one there. There's no headlights, there's no traffic there. Whatever they want, we're agreeable to doing, but they had not decided. Right, and that's just as long as, but you're, you're still. Whatever they'd like. Because I know, I think at the last meeting, one of the, the I think Ms. Ms. Ryan said that. You know, one of her concerns was trash that blows out onto her property, and is the, was the fence uh, also to ameliorate any trash or things like that? Whatever they like. Okay. Good. Oh, is, is that it? Or that was about all I had to present on, as far as my end of things. If we get um, the architect to speak to some of the, the issues we brought up last time, or the landscaper, but if there's no more questions for me. Does anybody have any questions? Just a quick question. Can you show the exterior light um, oh, in yep. the back? Or you actually, yeah. I have it on here somewhere. So this is the, the new, we were to have a lighting only plan. Yeah. Um, as far as building lighting, there's be like a, a wall pack type fixture to illuminate the loading area. And then under the canopy, there'd be like a recess, just a typical recess light to illuminate the parking area there. And then all on the sidewalks, we're proposing just ground-mounted four-foot-tall bollards mm -hmm. and three or four 14-foot-tall um, light posts to illuminate the back half of this parking lot here to get people safely to the sidewalk. So where do you abut the neighbors? Nothing. No light. There, there were some renderings that were... Um, we have to, I don't know if you have those as part of your yeah, presentation. Yeah, yeah. You know, hey, we've got those up and... Okay. Somebody else have a question? I, I just okay. had a note. Um, so the plans you submitted here actually address, and we just got revised plans here, address one of the comments regarding water. You all received the water analysis that was um, done on the FCW showing that there was adequate pressure flows. So there was no need for that separate um, storage right. tank which was of concern to DPW. So these plans show a direct water line connection to um, the water line. The public water. Correct. The plans in front of you show um, an underground water storage tank in this area. That's no longer required. Um, DPW hired an independent engineer to review the water application and the direct connection is suitable now. That was the only change on this plan from what you have in front of you. Any other questions? Here from the architect. Okay, thank you. Okay. Let's see if I can get your stuff up here, Yeah. Do we want to discuss that sidewalk remediation issue now, or is that? You guys want to talk about it now? Sure. Um, 
So why don't you, you want to talk about the question? Yeah, so the, so the issue um, is that um, there's the whole conversation, obviously, about that there is a requirement that whenever a project comes in, you can build sidewalks on, on for their portion of the property. That's, a, that's, that's on-site um, improvements. That's different from off-site traffic mitigation. It's also part of the um, requirements and zoning. So um, uh, the, in the intervening time, the city has had meetings with um, residents in the Leeds neighborhood about how to use other traffic mitigation monies, um, specifically coming from the Beaver Road project. So there's been a lot of discussion about um, what the best use of traffic mitigation funding and so at a staff level, we looked at um, one of the big changes, and you guys probably remember from the discussion at the Beaver Group, that the angle of Leonard Street coming into Route 9 um, allows for um, speeding cars coming off Route 9 just to zip into the neighborhood, and that's been a, a constant um, uh, point of contention, I think, in the neighborhood. So one of the issues is whether or not, you know, certainly traffic mitigation could be put towards analyzing that intersection of Leonard Street, which is a direct relationship to this project. Um, the other idea is to potentially, um, in lieu of building sidewalks, where in this area of Route 9, we're probably not going to have sidewalks for a really long time. Does it make sense to even do sidewalks on the other side? Or maybe take that same funding and put it into a really um, um, significant change at that Leonard Street intersection. We can't, the board can't require that because they are required to do sidewalks. So the applicant would have to offer saying, we, you know, they would offer in, in lieu of constructing sidewalks on any side of Route 9, they would offer to put that money toward um, looking at the redesign of Leonard Street. And however far that went, then we could potentially get minor, you know, minor adjustment, make that right angle intersection instead of a and I think it came up at the last hearing about the idea of putting sidewalks on the east side of the town in front of the, the houses. You know, the, 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 the neighbors would be then therefore responsible for shoveling yeah. a sidewalk that really doesn't yeah. quite go anywhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you all have done that before and, and, and tried to make connections and step by step to other neighborhoods. So, but it's really sort of there is a neighborhood on the other side. I mean, there's the density, of, the housing density on the other side of Route 9 is quite good. Even when there's cemeteries? Well, so, so I guess, Carol, the, the question is, um, is, is it up to, we can decide, if we as the board can decide, well, no, we want the sidewalks on the, the east side. We want the sidewalks on the west side, or does the app, is that, we should first decide what we want as the board, and then if we don't want either of those, and we want the money to be used for Leonard Street, we can ask the applicant if that's agreeable for them. Is that kind of the three things we could do? Mark? I, 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 I struggled with the need for sidewalks on this side, because I didn't think about that. I thought it was a better solution for Cross Street, but I think it's better still for the Leonard Street intersection, which impacts this site and the traffic in this direct area. Uh, so I think the money would be better spent than that. Yeah. You know, my experience in doing street design is somewhat limited, but I don't know that you're going to come up with enough money to bring design into this. I'm just, I'm pessimistic. That, I mean, that may be what we want, but I'm... Well, know. there's there's two, so there's, the, there's the traffic mitigation money and there's the money for the sidewalks. So there's, there's, Chunks of money. I don't, I don't know what it costs to redesign this uh, intersection. That's way more than we might think. I mean, I'm just looking, uh, one thing I, I know we wouldn't do it at the level of construct that I said so that meeting recently. I mean, do, but how do you do the design work and you put in the granite curbs? I mean, you know, it's just an expensive proposition. Well, this is design, not construction, right? Well, I mean, we, you, you can take the fans. money as far as you can okay. go. And it's just really yeah. sort of making a, a right angle turn and bringing the sidewalks in. It might not be that much effort. It's not. It's a residential neighborhood intersection. It's not two commercial, you know, corners. I'm not suggesting that it's not a 
expensive, but um, nobody's looked at it. So. Yeah. I was just wondering if this is something also where the, it would be important to hear from the newsletters um, what they want in terms of sidewalks. I mean, yeah, we can wait till we hear from them and we can make the decision later on tonight. Yeah, so. it, it is interesting to me that I, I see sidewalks as being such a wonderful asset to a neighborhood, and then all of a sudden the customers say, no, I don't even want to show Well, at least okay, so the butters are hearing the discussion yeah. now, so when the butters do speak, they can talk to this issue. And uh, so let's hear what the butters have to say before we talk more about this. So should we hear from the architect then? I'm uh, Constantine Samides, the architect, and I'm going to present the, uh, the three different views that we were asked to uh, create to show uh, what will be seen from Route 9 and from the neighboring houses uh, uh, adjacent to the property. And, but with me will be the landscape architect that will address the actual tree plantings that take place. Uh, this is the, the site plan of the proposed uh, new building, and these are the three views that are going to be shown uh, in, in renderings. Uh, we have uh, sections one, section two, section three. These show the trees and these lines show the views that are blocked by the trees. Uh, some of you can't read them from here. Some are new and some are existing, but they've been identified as such. Uh, same with uh, the different, uh, whether it's from the Gruen Wall or the Thrain uh, residences from the backyard uh, and from Route 9. The different uh, views shown for a person standing and looking towards the new building which is here this is the one story and now faces the residences and route nine and this is the three story and that's really the, the roof screen which is the man side roof that you've seen in the rendering and it's actually a flat roof with a screen in front of it to screen all the rooftop equipment from view from the neighbors so we have uh, three views that we're going to uh, show you Okay. This is uh, the existing driveway with the existing house that's going to be demolished. Yeah, it's not really showing each individual one. You can zoom in on it if you want. Yeah. Not used to this version. Okay. Keep the good cold rock more. Okay. All right. This the house is going to be uh, going to be demolished, and this is the, the 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 view after the house is demolished, and these are new trees in the foreground, and that's another new tree in the background, and right behind it is the is the proposed building. Uh, and this is to illustrate that standing on Route 9 at that property that's going to be revitalized and cleaned up with all the stuff that's in it and the house demolished it, uh, the new landscaping and the new trees will screen the building from Route 9. Do you want to address any of those trees? No, that's, so that's pretty clear. Uh, the next view is, I think, from the Grunwald residence. And... The next view, and this is from that, that's from Route 9, but from that backyard now. And we've been very careful to, to uh, place the, uh, the trees that the landscape architect uh, specified and to show them in actual height and species. And this is, these are the, all the new trees that are going to be planted. There are some existing trees in the background, and through the trees, if you look closely, uh, the building is back there. And there's also a fence with the building in back. But these are the actual trees 
that will be placed on site. The landscape architect will be there when they actually uh, put the trees in to make sure that they're put in the proper location. And if I understand that sometimes the owners are there and you can go verify uh, where they want those those trees. And uh, you want to discuss any of those trees, David? Well, I'll speak in general when I have a chance about the species and so on, but no reason to now? No. no? Okay, can you answer, please? And, that, and there's the third uh, from the Thrain residence. Again, uh, these are a row of, of trees with a fence and the building in the background uh, that will be screened. Not 100%, but certainly as the trees grow fuller, uh, it will be a perfectly uh, very good, good evergreen uh, screen of, of the building and enhance uh, the property of, of the residents. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, well, any questions for the architect? Yeah, how long will it take for the trees to get to the uh, height C show? That's, that's the height as planted. Uh, I was looking at the plan and it's talking about seven to eight feet for most of them. But Some on of those the, look like 20, 30 foot trees. I'm assuming they're. They were shown as size. Yes, That's what I told my staff. They looked a lot taller than seven or eight feet. I don't see a single tree in here that's um, more than 10 to 12 feet. Well, some of the deciduous trees are taller. Right. But I was the, looking at, at yeah, I was looking at things like the evergreens. The, uh, the they did look a lot taller than that. So the, the elevation. The, these trees haven't changed. They're all right. at least 10 feet tall. Mm -hmm. So we did a section and these... We showed them. Right. And they, they will, from day one, pretty much cover and close, close off the view from this house of the building. And they're going to grow two, 18 inches to 2 feet a year. Right. Those are the other people, right? Yeah. Let me just back up and just... Can I speak in general about the, the, the plan and the changes that have been made? Because my name is David Payne, Planet Green Landscape Architecture, and uh, just to identify myself, um, because we were able to move the building, substantial room was gained, and which allowed us to completely change the character of the proposed buffer, primarily along the southern property here. If you recall the previous plan, we basically had to plant a row of evergreen trees. And by the fact we gained 20, sometimes 30 feet, we not, I was able to get a berm in here, three foot high, 16 feet wide at its base. So a nice wide berm that will undulate a little up and down so it's not just gonna be a, you know, like a dike. <coughs> and we could then plan plant new trees, both deciduous and evergreen, I was able to then mix and have more room to plant different kinds of species. So the heights of the trees remained no smaller than the ones previously, but we were able to again mix and I used species that were from the town's um, approved list and others as well. So there's now, instead of one variety of evergreen, we've got five different varieties of evergreen. And we also have three or four different varieties of deciduous trees along here. We have other deciduous and evergreen trees here. that are primarily, again, for kind of screening the property from Route 9. And those trees are, are picked for their screening and also for their ability to withstand salt spray. And same, so any trees that are close to Route 9 here are, were picked for their tolerance to salt. The, around this property here, we gain room as well. So not only do we have, we could mix the evergreens and put some deciduous as well in here, and they're primarily on the inside of a fence that's now in here. And we've put some as well 
on the outside of the fence. As I said, this couldn't really be changed because of the, there's a detention basin here and there's no room. Um, so the, the other important um, um, improvement was all around the entire site, we've got additional shade trees in the parking lot and around the, the, the roadways that are here and coming in the entranceway. So um, the trees and the size of the trees that we placed haven't changed. I mean, the heights of them have not changed since the previous plan. That was carefully analyzed in a 3D model we did. So we are, are quite confident that from day one there, I, I won't say that it'll be 100% blocking, but you're, we're going to be close to blocking the view of the building from the driveway here and from this property here and this property here. Because these trees have been moved a little bit further away, you know, screening is more effective the closer the screening element is to your view. So if you move trees further away, then it's going you know, they, they need to be bigger, but we kept them the same, but we've added, we've added a fence in there. So as I said, these are significant trees in height and they're gonna grow uh, at least a foot maybe the first year and then 18 inches to two feet beyond that. This is a wet soil area along the southern property line here. And now because we have a berm, it's three feet high, it's going to allow the trees to, I mean, I picked trees again that will that could withstand some wet feet, but they're going to be a little happier now that they're planted on berm as well. So, any questions? It's a, it's a much improved plan. I didn't want to sound totally hostile there, but this is no, and, way better and I was very happy. And I totally agree. And the, I was, I was hand-tied by the fact that we had to, you know, we wanted to buffer and we had such little room. And I, I you know, I concur with you wholeheartedly. You know, not only visually it's going to be better, nat it's a much more natural plan. It's going to be better for wildlife and just going to blend in better over time. And Dave, I, I thought when we coordinated that we were going to preserve most of the trees and only a few were going to be. That's correct. So, so all the way along there's a stone wall here and as many trees as we can preserve because there's very little grading going on in here. So any of the significant trees that can remain, they will. And then we'll supplement and plant in amongst them. In, in the buffer zones. Is the tree count the same as it was before, just different variety, or is the tree count actually increased? Tree, tree, tree count's about the same, but varieties have changed. Any other questions? Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, presentations from your side? I just want to point one thing out in your traffic. If Marianne doesn't remember, uh, when we did meet with the neighbors, they don't like the location of the bus stop. I know that will be fixed by the traffic committee and PBPA. But Marianne said she has observed the visitors coming to Linda Manor now and employees who use the bus public transportation. The bulk of that is coming from Northampton side, which means they're dropped off right at the driveway. But when they're waiting, they're waiting for the other side, and the bus stop is on this side now. I, I leave it to PBPA to, to do that. We don't really care whatever the traffic people decide what makes sense. But the way it's shown on the plan, because zoning requires it, it's on our corner here. But it may not make sense to have it in that location. I just, so she you pointed make that, that condition out. that if the bus shelter goes in the green room, you can feel it or the traffic goes. Who owns the property on the other side? Which we well, it would be in the right of way. It would be in the right of way. The mass, how they lay out, is pretty wide there. Yeah. Is it? Okay. Is there a possibility of two bus shelters? More of each side? Um, <coughs> two, two. 
I don't know that, I mean, if people are being dropped off in the driveway, and then they can go by the doors if they're waiting for the pickup, and it's the other side. That's where you live in the shelter. Yeah, typically, I think we've done one. Oh, yeah. We typically do one. Like when, when we did the uh, near the Clary Hotel, the medical building, we asked for one on the on medical side. building side. Right. right. Uh, so. Yeah, it's just, I think it's, 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 it goes right. It's hard for us to ask for two. We haven't done that historically. I mean, unless you know, that might be the case if we had data showing that there was uh, you know, population. One way we're selling it more practically. Yeah, yeah. Employees who live in Martin's Bird. Andrew? Yeah, one thing. Um, I didn't actually look, but are we looking at bike racks on this at all? For, like, I mean, not for residents, but, but um, workers? There is a bike rack showing on both plants. Okay. And, uh, where, where is it? I didn't look for it. So. For the Zoe? Yeah, there it is. Right here, we're proposing one on the Zoe property. So that's C3. C3? Okay. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Sorry. I didn't know the question. I haven't thought to look for it. So. And there's one at the Linda Manor edition as well. Right. So. Um, so if there's no other questions, we can open it up to the public. Okay. Um, so we'll open it up to the public. So um, any member of the public who wants to comment, come on up to the podium, state your name, and um, have your set. Uh, oh, sorry, name and address. Anybody like to speak? Good evening. Uh, my name is Kim Beerwork, uh, 297 Aidenville Road. Um, I guess the first thing I want to say is that I think that the plan as presented is much improved. I think there are a lot of positive changes. I think that they've been recept receptive to the concerns of the committee and to the neighbors, and I think that's, that's a great positive step. I wish it had happened earlier, but I'm certainly glad that it happened. Um, in regards to the uh, trees and, and the landscaping plan in general, um, again, the, the visual photographs, uh, seem to indicate that things will be blocked off fairly well. I would like to, to see that, that down the road, that a condition, uh, if this is approved, would be that those trees remain alive after five years, seven years, or ten years, and that we're talking about trees in a very wet environment, and certainly some of them may not survive. Now, I would hope that there is a condition that after five years, or seven years, or ten years, those trees do remain alive. Um, uh, I just have a point. I think, Karen can address it, but I think if it's shown in the plans, Three dogs, they have to replace it. So, is that? Yeah, it becomes an enforcement issue. Right. It? After how many years? I mean, we're talking five years, 20 years, 50 Forever. years? Forever. Until Forever. the project goes away. Until the project goes away. Yeah. Right. So, for example, we've had issues, say, at King Street with one of the car dealerships, one of the lead dealerships. Right. They planted trees, they died. We had them replant all the trees. Okay. They die again, they have to replant them all again. Same thing at Cole Morgan. Cole Morgan. Yeah. Same okay. thing. In fact, we just, it, 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 so. Once they're on the plan, the plan's approved, they have to be there forever. Yeah. Okay. That's always good to hear. Um, glad to know that. Um, having said what I've said previously, I still don't think that this is the right kind of project to have right in that spot. I think there are many other places in Northampton that might be better suited for a facility like this. I think Northampton um, can benefit from a facility like this. And there's any question about that. But I just don't know if it's the right spot. The building, as drawn, as existed, is a three-story building. It's very large, it's very large in comparison to everything that surrounds it. Um, so much so that it's going to dwarf everything. It will change the landscape of that part of town forever. So in making that decision, I think we have to be cognizant of the fact that it will change everything that's up there. It will change the neighbors. It will change property values. It will change the way it looks. And trying to think about how, to, how this would somehow be you know, easy to understand, for me to understand, I sort of thought about, I'm living in a house, I've got a three-car garage, I've got two kids who are 14 years old, I've got two cars, Somebody, and I live very close to the road. Someone comes up, they want to sell me a car. 
1972 Chevy Impala, big honking vehicle. And one of my kids, when their license can go, hit something and they're still going to survive. Um, it's all dusty and dirty. The tires are worn. And so I said, well, you want to buy it? I mean, I'm intrigued. It's a possibility for my family. And I put her up next to my garage and I realized it's not going to fit in the garage. It's not going to fit. I said, oh, I, don't, I have to think about it. The guy comes back two weeks later, he's polished up the car, put new tires on it, looks nice from the outside. Bottom line is the car looks more appealing, but it's still not going to fit in that garage. I still can't use it. As much as I'd like to have that vehicle, as much as Northampton might want to have okay, a center like this, does it actually fit in this location? Is it a good, harmonious fit with the neighborhood and with everything that surrounds it? And that's where my biggest question is. Again, I think they've done a great job of trying to make it fit, but the bottom line is it still doesn't quite fit, in my mind, for that part of Leeds. So, thanks. Good evening. My name is John Lutz. I live at uh, 291 Haydenville Road. I live next to Kim and Louie's driveway, so I'm not at a direct abutter, but almost by about a few feet. I uh, just want to uh, do some of the same things that Kim did and, and acknowledge, first of all acknowledge that there's no question that the design team has been very responsive and attempted to make all the needs and all the issues that were addressed both last month and even Tuesday night uh, and they were very receptive and, and very uh, accommodating in that way. Um, I think just on one small point um, about the lighting, the discussion has been about the lighting that's related to the outside of the building. Don't forget there are 80 residences all that have lights and windows as well. Uh, I can go to my driveway today and see Linda Manor and see the lights. So I'm assuming if a building is between me and Linda Manor, I'm going to see even more lights and more of it because it's going to be that much closer. So don't forget, the building has 80 residences, 80 windows, 80 lights, living rooms, things like that. So I can already see the building that's there now. I'm sure I'm going to see this one. It's going to be half again as close. So just a point there about the lighting. I think it's also important to remember that the view of many of the neighbors, including the Beerworts, ourselves, some of the other neighbors that are farther down Route 9, is not from the front. In fact, I don't think any of the neighbors see the front of the building. We all see the side or the back. So while the folks at Linda Manor will have a very nice view of the front of the building, those of us that live around it will see the side or the back. And I know that the views that they've looked at are from Route 9. Well, my yard and my driveway is in from Route 9, 75 feet or so. And so, of course, Kim and Louise is much farther. So our view is going to be much different. It's not going to be from Route 9. It's going to be from our yards or from our driveways. And it's going to be a lot different view as it is today of Linda Manor. <laughs> You know, on Route 9, when the manor sits way back and it's probably visible and it's very well and hidden and all those things. But not from my house. I can look crossways across the current property and see the lights and see the parking and all the things that are there now. So I think the other thing that's important to remember is that if you look at the Sustainable Northampton Comprehensive Plan, it talks about one of the guiding principles being concentrating development in neighborhood, village, and commercial centers. This is a neighborhood. This is not a neighborhood building. It's a commercial building, you know, for for-profit, very large, very big footprint. I understand that it's only going to use 20% of the total lot that it's on. 80% of the lot will still be open space, but that 20% puts it in close proximity to all the people that live around it. So the fact that there's 80% still open is great for the little creatures and everyone, but for the people that live there, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. Uh, in reality. I think the other thing to, to note, and Kim and Louie have been very gracious about this, that many of the changes that have been made make it better for those of us that live along Route 9, make it worse for them. The building and all the business is now closer to their house, not farther away. The lighting is all closer, the traffic, the, the service deliveries are all closer to them, not farther away. So while those of us along Route 9, quote unquote, have benefited, they have not, and I think it's important to remember that. If you look at, again, if you look out to the zoning ordinance, you know, uh, regarding the qualifications for a special permit, must find the following criteria are met. The requested, requested use protects adjoining premises from against seriously detrimental uses. 
I don't think putting a three-story, 76,000 square foot building protects the adjoining properties from detrimental uses. We'll promote a harmonious relationship of structures and open spaces. As I mentioned last time, this building would be 38 times the size of my house. That doesn't seem to be very harmonious. We'll, we'll not unduly impair the integrity of character of the district. As Kim pointed out, it's a residential district. This is not a residential building. It's a commercial structure that far outweighs the buildings around it and will dwarf them. It will promote prom city planning objectives to the extent possible. Given your guiding principles, it doesn't seem that it really does that. In their application, the development team cited the VA hospital, Linda Manor, and Bear Hill Estates as related and examples. I live next to the VA center. I walk my dog there all the time. I use it, I gave blood there on Wednesday. But it sits a half a mile back from Route 9. A half a mile if you walk up the hill. You can't see most of the VA property from Route 9. You can see the industrial building there that's close. But most of the buildings are not visible from Route 9. This building is going to be very visible from Route 9 and certainly from those abutters that are close to it. Linda Manor has been there a long time. Trees have grown. It sits way back. But again, it doesn't sit way back as the crow flies and visually from those neighbors that are around it. Bear Hill Estates is not really a comparable. It's detached homes. It abuts the VA property. It abuts a school and has one single family home in front of it. And it still sits way back from the road. And eventually, I'm sure trees will grow but it's detached homes. It's not an 80 residence. There probably won't be as many people living at Bear Hill Estates when it's fully occupied as are going to live in this one building. So I, I don't think those are really comparable examples. As Kim mentioned, and I think you know, we have discussed, I, I think you know, there are just other locations where this would be more appropriate project. It really seems the only reason that this project to be in this place is economics. It's coincidentally next to the property developed by the same developer. This would be run by the same organization. It's just an economic convenience. Economies of scale will come into play, and economically it'll be better than putting it somewhere else. I don't think the city, hopefully, makes decisions purely based upon granting special permits just because the economics work for the developer. Hopefully they take into consider other, other things that work, don't work for the neighbors. Again, one of the applaud the work that's been done by the team, but I would have to agree with Kim that it's just too big a building and too small a space, and it really is not appropriate for the neighborhood. I don't know how this exactly works. If the building does become inevitable, there are some things I would like to present at consideration, an itemized list of mitigation actions that can be shared with neighbors and the city so we can make sure they all happen for those of us who be living there for a long time. A long-term maintenance plan for all the landscaping. I, I know you addressed that, but just so we would know like, what's supposed to happen so we can, uh, I think all of us would be pretty diligent monitors. Um, and maybe the idea that there's a reserve of trees and scrub, uh, not scrubs, shrubs, uh, for the landscape plan so that as things are put in, if we find gaps, if we find things that aren't working, that those would already have been purchased and they, they are you know, so built into the plan that can be placed according to need uh, because, you know, when you start planting trees and building things, things shift and that type of thing. But again, uh, our hope would be that uh, the current is not granted. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, Mary and Thrain, 339 Haydenville Road. Um, I'm sorry, can you say the last name one? Thrain, Mary Ann. Um, I, I agree with my neighbors and friends that, uh, again, the, uh, the planners have worked well with us. They, they even listened to our comments and knew who made them, which really surprised me that they listened and took action, and, and I'm happy to know that. But I'm going to, not to reiterate everything we had said, I, I'm just concerned with um, making a quick decision. I would just hope that you would take your time and really think about the impact this is going to have on all of our lives that we have tried to make there, and it's a big impact. It, it, it will be a big change for us, and my main concern is not to make a fast decision, decision to really think about this and consider everything that's good for Northampton and, and the neighborhood. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.
Janet Grunwald, 319 Haydenville Road in Leeds. Uh, I'm the house that uh, geographically is closest to the proposed building. And as you can see from the scale, uh, probably about 40 times the size of my home, a one-story ran uh, one ranch uh, coming up against a three-story building. And while I appreciate the reversal of the building, bringing the one-story um, side closer to me, it is still an enormous construction site, uh, an enormous building that would severely impact the expectation that I had when just over three years ago purchased this house with my partner. My partner uh, is no longer living. Uh, I think if she were here, she would be heartbroken at the thought of something of this size um, being thrust into um, the area that we, um, we decided to call home um, based on the neighborhood and the appearance of the neighborhood being a major part of it as woodland. <coughs> um, and to make such a drastic change um, is just going to be an enormous impact on um, the life that I'm continuing to live in, on that property. Uh, and just to make a comment about the, um, the sidewalks, um, since um, Marianne uh, did not mention that, um, it would be, um, I think we all agree, those of us who um, would be impacted by that, that it would be a serious issue if um, sidewalks were put on our uh, side of the road. Um, it would cause us to be responsible for um, shoveling, plowing, um, the way the um, telephone poles and mailboxes are set up, they would be enormously impacted. Um, my property has a significant slope down to Route 9. Uh, a large part of my front yard probably be cut into and retaining wall being placed there, I would think, um, to make way for a sidewalk. It just does not seem practical um, in the construction of it, nor does it seem like a place where uh, a sidewalk really uh, needs to be placed. And I hope... Uh, the board will take all of that in consideration, uh, all that I've said and all my neighbors have said. Thank you. I had honestly planned not to say anything tonight. Um, Tat Chapin Bishop, 271 Haydenville Road. Um, I also really appreciate uh, the sensitivity and the care that went into revising the plan uh, all of the revisions are good ones, uh, as far as I can tell. Um, I still look at that site map, and I look at the size of my neighbor's houses, and they could be swallowed by the lobby of that building. I think we're all really happy to see the Alzheimer's unit go in. We care about elders. Uh, Janet has uh, a mom, I'm sorry, Ms. Grunwald has a mom who's currently in a facility, my husband and I cared for his grandmother for four years until uh, two months before her death when she finally needed a Hoyer lift and more care than we could provide at home. We really do care about having resources for elders and I think that unfortunately there's been some implication that that's not true. Um, that is true and actually that's part of my concern. Um, if we're talking about assisted care uh, residents. We're talking about elders who are uh, going to be fairly mobile and I think they're going to want to get up and go places. Uh, I, I, I would. Uh, having a van that goes back and forth to the town is great, but I am a walker. My husband rides his bike all the time. We know these neighborhoods. I know them on foot. I walk down to Musante Beach every day in the summer. I never, ever walk along Route 9. I like to go to Scotty's uh, Meadowcrest Golf for an ice cream cone. I would no more walk down Route 9 to get there than I can't think. That's playing in traffic. It's not safe to do. I don't think installing a sidewalk changes that. Uh, I base that on the number of accidents that I've seen, including on the day, as I recall, of uh, Ms. Grunewald's wife's wake. There was a car that was actually parked off the road 
in her yard that was rear-ended along Route 9. I think that putting a sidewalk along Route 9 on that side of the road makes about as much sense as putting a sidewalk along I-89 uh, or I-91. Some roads just aren't real conducive. When I walk, I cross Route 9, I go down Leonard Street, I walk those neighborhoods when my husband bikes. We get onto Leonard Street and we take Leonard Street to get to the bike path because we're not dumb. But that's a long way out of the way and I don't see a whole lot of elders being able to do that. This is a really isolated location. We're rural, we're residential. Yeah, I understand it would be residential, but so out of scale. Thank you. Thank you. I am Gene Tasty. I represent Ward 7 and uh, where this project is going. And I was pleasantly surprised with uh, the sensitivity that the developer has showed to the concern of the neighborhood. Um, the, the question that I still have um, is the size of the project. I am convinced it will absolutely affect the property values of the neighbors. Absolutely. Uh, the size of the project is enormous. It really is. And it needs a special permit because it's not allowed by right in that zone, in the residential zone. It's a business. Um, so. Regardless of the, how they've changed the project around and how, how the landscaping is, which is, the trees are fantastic, nice job. But the project, I still think, is too big. And I try to look at it as how, it, how is it possibly harmonious with a single family ranch houses in a residential area. We all get affected a little bit by development everywhere. Um, but the, the VA, they don't require a permit for anything. We don't have any jurisdiction over a federal reservation. Um, so. And it's hard to make that comparison with the two. So thank you very much. Anybody else? Thank you. Um, so comments from the board, questions? So we have two, there's, uh, I, I, we spend most of our time talking about the, the new building, but there's actually two permits in front of us. One is the expansion for the demander. And we have two permits, we're going to have two votes. Um, there hasn't been a lot of questions or comments about the expansion to Linda Manor. Does anybody have any questions or comments about that? Um, I mean, so with the, the, the conditions on that one, they're going to fix the lighting levels. Yeah. Um, on the existing poles and the existing exterior lighting. Well, that's part of the plan, so that doesn't need to be a condition. Oh, I thought that we had made the those conditions. That we asked that was last part of the, okay, that, they, they revised the plan. They did it. Okay. Um, so most of the conversation I guess we're going to have is on the, on the new building itself. Uh, so. Are you suggesting we um, Let's, let's, let's wait until we have all the discussions because I'm not sure if there any, there's going to be any impact to both, both at the same time. Same but time. I just want to make sure that because we spend most of our time talking about the, right. the new building, is there any, anybody have questions. any questions or comments about the, the, the expansion itself? So that one seems pretty straightforward. Yeah. Okay. Um, so some of the questions and some of the comments we had about the second, uh, about the newer building, um, there uh, we've heard from the neighbors um, about the planting. There's concern that to make sure that the, the, whatever planting is there is maintained. I think uh, Mr. Buer asked a question about replacing, and Mr. Lutz about a maintenance plan. I'm not sure, is, is a maintenance plan necessary because the trees, as we said, uh, once they're on the plan, they have to be maintained? Right, I mean, one of, the, um, one of the issues, and I didn't look closely enough about the notes, but 
is um, the first couple of years are the most important in terms of irrigation and, and, um, and you know, monitoring. So um, if there isn't an adequate note that addresses that, that could certainly be a condition because that's really sort of the survival period, I guess, as well. What would, would, um, would, would, would be the context of the note? Well, I, I, um, that there, that the, uh, so in terms of a maintenance plan, that there would be um, an adequate um, plan that maybe they submit prior to construction showing what their maintenance schedule is based on the species selected. So showing that they're doing, you know, weekly or monthly waterings depending on the species and the location. Um, you know, that, that could be done. Um, but they are required to replace them. And I think it makes, makes sense that the um, landscape architect would be on site during planting because a lot of times the contractor, excuse me, <coughs> putting the um, landscaping in doesn't really know anything about plants and it's just plunking them in. So it, it would make sense to have that. Okay. And I think we did hear from the applicant that they're working with the neighbors during the planting process such that there's agreement as to placement. Was that? Mr. Payne, I think that was what, was, was it you who said that? No, I said that. Oh, you I said that. On his behalf, though. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Mr. Samini said that. Um, okay. Um, so, do people amenable, is that a condition that uh, the landscape architect is, is there and been working with the neighbors trying to plan Yeah, and just a note, actually, that, that reminded me of the comment that was made in the uh, by the water consultant and uh, as it relates to irrigation. Haven't had a discussion about irrigation. Clearly, there's a lot of plantings, and right. they they'll, need, right. they'll need water, uh, particularly in the first few years. So um, it might be good to sort of square away that, and whether or not we want to accommodate that recommendation from the um, water uh, engineer. So would that be included in the maintenance plan? Well, no, I think that could, that's a general condition. If you all feel like it's appropriate to put a condition that um, public water not be used for irrigation, um, then that's a separate condition. Well, I, would, I would certainly say that I think it's an excellent idea. So that the condition would be public water not used for irrigation during the first three years? or No, I mean, ever? there would not be a connection to from the public water supply to the irrigation system, whatever irrigation system. So people in medical design as a condition? Yeah. Okay. Great. I just wanted to point out that our, we don't really have much enforcement powers, certainly down the line, and we don't have any. It's up to the building inspector to enforce that. I just wanted to, people not to come to us for five years from now. We just don't have any power to enforce Right. So the, so the, the, the enforcement of the plantings and the plan is done by the building inspector. So that's the, the, the actual enforcement arm of the plan department. Um, there was one thing we didn't hear about was, um, I think they, they mentioned that they're going to be protecting any specimen trees that are on the site. Do we require a specific survey? Does the, do you go out? Does well, they, I don't think they mentioned specimen. I think they said existing trees. Yeah. So, um, okay. Significant trees, sorry. Yeah, I think it was significant trees. So, um, I mean, they do show on the plan some trees they're removing, but who goes out or, I think in the past we've had a tree committee or someone from the planning department to go out and make sure that well, the trees are marked. Yeah, I think probably it makes, I think there have been issues in the past where applicants have said they're going to preserve certain trees and then um, that information somehow or another doesn't get passed on to the person who's doing the work on site, and so those trees disappear. So it probably makes sense to have them flagged and then checked um, and verified so that whoever's doing the contract work for removal knows which ones to remove. And A lot of it was on Hospital Hill, where there were lots of old specimen trees, significant trees in the plan. There. I don't think that. Population trees like that up there, but certainly nobody can have a look. But the, the ones that should be safe should be marked so that they're not. I mean, we've had, you know, at uh, Clark School where somebody accidentally removed. Yeah. Right. Well, that's that's true. Yeah. 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 <laughs>
I would say I, I took an admittedly brief walk through the, around the woods. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, there weren't a lot of obvious great boundary trees. There wasn't anything like the, the beaches up on Hospital Hill. Mm -hmm. And I would be quite willing to trust that, you know, that the landscape architect had flagged trees and had not had them removed. But that would be my take on it. Yeah. The other thing I might suggest and I would do is not only flag them but um, have a sort of a no tread zone around the canopy of those trees so that during construction they're not there's not soil is not compacted contractors are generally not very uh, respectful of that so we could put up a temporary fence along the areas where we're going to protect those trees yeah I think so, I mean, I guess I should, one of the questions I should ask right, even before we get into some of the more detailed discussions, because uh, there's a couple of things to discuss, is uh, I think the plans are a great improvement from the last plan. The removal of the second driveway, the just pushing back the building, the moving of the parking. I mean, all in all, this is a much better proposal, a much better plan than what we saw back in January. Um, so, are people feeling is the consensus, and you can go around the room, or if people want to weigh in, is, are people feeling comfortable with this redesign the way it is now, uh, that we should continue talking about the details? Yes. Yes, Brandy, Desmond, Mark, yeah. Andrew? I, well, I feel that um, there's really significant comments that have been made about the harmoniousness of the neighborhood. And this is a very, very large structure in a beautiful wooded area. I, I know that it's not any higher than what the zoning says. I mean, it, it's within the limits. It's a 35-foot high structure. Um, so, I, you know, I don't think it's possible to deny the application on there not meeting the zoning requirements. But in terms of the, the, the relationship to the neighborhood, it's, it's drastically large. And this is a neighborhood with small houses that are... Um, going to be hugely affected. So I guess I, I have, I, I, in general, think they made very responsive um, changes, and I'm happy with that. But I also think it's just very unfortunate that it's this enormous building. I'm happy with what the, the enlargement of, of Linda Man. I think that's excellent. Seven years well, I just, I think that at least we have the consensus that we should continue the discussion. Yeah, I mean, when I said I'm happy to continue the discussion, I must admit, I am somewhat unhappy with the scale of the building. But I think, um, I don't think the plan is going to improve. So I think we can talk about the details and then have a discussion, because that's, that's really what I'm Carol, did you have a comment? No, I, I, I think it's much improved. Um, over last time, I'm happy with some of the mitigation. Because um, some of the other things that have come up, I mean, we've talked about... Um, protecting the existing trees, we talked about the landscape around site during the plantings, we talked about the maintenance plan and the, the lack of public water being used for the irrigation. Uh, a couple things that came up from the last meeting that weren't echoed today, but a couple things that came up last time were things like um, hours of operation. I think one of the neighbors was talking about um, you know, landscaping work during the summer happening at 6 o'clock in the morning, the deliveries happen, happening. And I think we should be very clear um, that landscape work at 6 o'clock in the morning is not allowed. Not only is it not allowed by zoning. It's not allowed by zoning. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah it, that's, that's actually a violation of the zoning. But um, I think one of the things we should talk about is you know, the hours of operation. Do we want, I'm not sure if we can do this, Carol, but I know the zoning says they can't do landscape work before a certain time. Uh, do we have to necessarily condition that? No, I mean, it's a code violation. So the complaints will be handled through the building commission yeah. process. Didn't we have restrictions on home order, similar for, for truck deliveries and so forth, and lighting? Yeah, I we put we, some conditions on the... Yeah, the 18 wheelers couldn't come. Is it at night? I can't remember what we did. <coughs> I can't remember, but I thought we had conditions specific to that. Yeah, the time of deliveries. Deliveries oh, and, and lighting at night. Wait, so what about know. turning off the lights at night? Uh, well, with Cole Morgan, in some places, we've had the parking lights turned off. 
for like the loading bay side of Cole Morgan, those lights go off. And not only are they buffered by trees, but the lights actually go off. Um, in this case, there's not a lot of outside light. Um, the lighting that they, they do show is on the far side of the building. It's already screened from the, the neighbors. Uh, it's the, the, the lighting that would probably be the most effective is the lighting within the building itself where the residents are living. And I'm not sure if they can make people go to bed. People that age, you know, <laughs> go to bed, tend to go to bed earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Cole Morgan has 300 neighbors. Uh, in, in some ways, this is a yeah. similar discussion. I'm not sure if we all were on the board at the time of Cole Morgan. Cole Morgan is surrounded very much by yeah. smaller houses. We had a lot of discussions about screening. In fact, we had Cole Morgan come back at least once because we had the, uh, to. Uh, to make sure they're planting the right trees. Right. Um, but in that Cole Morgan building, there were houses that very much abut just the parking lot. You can see them, um, you know, and, and that was a big issue. And I think this, the applicant here, has done a lot to uh, add to the screening. Cole Morgan's also an industrial. Right, but, it is, but it, the fact is, it's similar. It's, it's surrounded by single family yeah. or two family houses. These are people's homes with, you know. Sure. Curtains shades, you know, they will have some window covering. They're not, it's not like, you know, there's some light bulbs on the side. Right. Or office shoes. Um, I like the delivery bay, the, <coughs> being the, the original plans had that on the um, house side, so that's at least some consideration of the noise. That's and the building is about 180 feet away from the nearest house. So it has moved back. In the original thing, remember the parking lot, which was right along the back property line of the abutters, which is a difficult place to put it. And remind me of the total acreage. I mean, out there like nine acres. The site's about 11 acres overall. 11. <coughs> um, the Manor's 14, and this one's 11. Um, well, I guess, I, I mean, uh, are there other conditions or other issues that people have with right now? I mean, well, we talked about sidewalks. Oh, yeah, we have to yeah. decide the sidewalk. Mark? I say most of the discussion has, has been on the, the planting buffer mm -hmm. in one sense or another from different vantage points and the sheer mass of the building. The size of the building is, is what it is. Um, so that aside, I think, I think not just the planting, but everything they've done favor of and I appreciate it. It sounds like they took great effort to listen to the concerns of the board and, and the public to do um, what they thought was best. My, my only thought was like a, along the Bureau property, since there are more footage um, available uh, for that buffer for the tree count to increase. Um, if we've got the mound and we've got the trees and now we have a greater variety of trees, but if the depth allows for that variety, I would, it would imply that the depth would allow for a greater tree count, which would help the buffer issue um, to, a, to a greater extent. Um, I don't know how we would qualify that. I don't know what the tree count is along that line, or if there's a 10% increase along that line or something like that. But it seems like the, the arbor vitae on, on the northwest piece of property the view, the view shown, it seems like those are going to do, and the fencing and so forth, those are going to do um, right away what um, what they need to do. Um, but along the, the, the Bureau of Property, I don't know that the renderings accurately show the actual tree height and, and what that day one vantage point would be. The, the, as Andrew pointed out, the, the trees just looked out of scale in those renderings. Um, and it wouldn't change to 10 more trees along that line or 15 more trees or whatever uh, of, of a similar height wouldn't help the, the height issue, but the density issue would, would, be, uh, would be better for the, for the abutter on that property. And that's the only thing I can think of along that line to, to help that situation. Mm -hmm. Can I respond? Okay. Sure. On the further south from the 
tree planting we did this this with the driveway and then there's a whole bunch of woods beyond that so this is this is not sitting in the field we're at the edge of the woods oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so they're going to be looking through woods and then at a new evergreen and mixed deciduous buffer mm -hmm. so it is going to be a significant screen and uh, with the mound it's going to add three extra feet of height to every tree that's planted on there so eight foot trees make 11 feet and on and on so I think probably we could be open to as one of the neighbors suggested some additional trees that could be not placed on a uh, on, on, on the plan, but be planted as needed, if needed, right. at the time of planting. How would we conditionalize that? I guess it, would it be, I mean, if, 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 if that's what's going to happen, if there's a, a tree subcommittee with the abutters and, and they want to be there with the, with the landscaper as the, as the, the landscape architect as they set the trees, and if we say, if there's 100 trees, say, and we say, you know, a 10% 10%. additional allotment, to be placed as determined by the abutters and in, in conjunction with the with the designer and the abutters. You know, I'm not saying add more ten along that line. However, it makes sense. You know, as as agreed upon, um, can only help the situation. And it seems like the space affords that to happen. Can I make a suggestion? Sure. That you know we we locate the trees as per the plan and then consult with the neighbors at the time, and then if it's sufficient, and it appears sufficient, that, that the developer isn't required to purchase, and that we purchase those trees only if necessary? Well, I think that's what Mark yeah, is saying. Is that what you're saying? Up, you could say up to, you know, plant them as shown, and then provide up to whatever the number's gonna be, 10% more, if, as necessary. As, if necessary, as determined by blah, blah, blah. Right. The only problem with that is, um, you know, one party may say they don't think it's necessary and the other party does. Right. Yeah. And then we don't have a clear path of what's required. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think it's, it's, it's um, commendable that the applicant is offering to you know, locate additional trees if necessary, but it doesn't really work with a permit condition. That would be my argument. It doesn't really work with a permit condition. Either you feel like the planting is adequate um, the way it is and given the circumstances on the site where there's existing tree uh, canopy and cover that's not going to be disturbed and then with this additional firm plus buffer or you think it's not quite adequate and you want additional trees. Yeah. And so I guess, you, you know, to the extent that you want to know more about really what it would look like from one vantage point that wasn't shown, you could ask for that information. Well, I think some of the comments made were, you know, from the Route 9 vantage point is one thing, but I don't see it from there. I see it from over here and from over here. I've got a straight shot and I see, you know, you know I'm going to see Linda Manor now, which means I'm going to see the second and third floor later, and maybe a, a tree strategically placed that's not on this plan would, would help that. And so I don't think if you said, you know, not to exceed uh, if required and had loose language like that, I can see what you're saying, that the two parties can say, well, it's needed and you no, know, it's not. But if you said 15 extra trees to be planted, whereas the term as, you know. Well, sir, I think the applicant is, I, I, I'm trying to remember a project where something similar was done, Mark. But two things I wanted to say, remember the two crisis houses disappearing. Right. So that house and all that open space and yeah. the dumpsters and whatever else is there is being planned. Right. Uh, number two, I think what David Payne had offered earlier was to say that when the planting is happening, he's happy to consult with the neighbors as to location. Because even though you show them on the plan, when you're actually standing in your yard, you may say, I really would like that tree right there. Right. <laughs> because it may make a difference to your window. So I, I'm happy with 15 extra trees. I'm happy to just say, I think if you just say consult with the landscape architect, to the location of the screening plantings, and then they could set. They could just meet with him. Uh, in fact, there's just two neighbors, right, that we're talking about. No, I know. I, I understand, but I think every effort should be made if it's going to happen to right to do but, as much as we can you, for those two neighbors. If you consult, I think they can pick where they go because mm -hmm. they would know as well as.
with anybody. Right. As, as opposed to trying to say, I want more, and no, it's not necessary, and whatever. It's just the same. But it's the same thing you're suggesting, but instead of necessarily being more, right. it's no, being more appropriate. Right. <coughs> John? I, I was just going to suggest that to try and solve the, in the uncertain problem to say, let's increase the number of trees purchased, you know, purchase the ones that are cited plus 25%. Those 25% are then placed in conjunction. You know, the plan is done, and then there's some held in abeyance that are done in conjunction with the landscape and the neighbors, so that that's done. And then if we find gaps or there's other things, then those, you know, you know you've already bought them, so they're going to be planted somewhere, and, you know, there's not the uncertainty about it. You know. It sounds almost like what you, you yeah. and Ed are saying the same, same thing. thing. Um, um, the numbers, the, the only difference is the numbers. So if we could... Uh, yeah, I would... I would hesitate to, I mean, 25%. There isn't room, realistically, for 25% more trees on this plan. Um, I know it looks like a lot of open space, but that would be an awful lot of trees, and you would just be throwing them in willy-nilly. Uh, maybe 10%, maybe 5%, but um, certainly buying trees is a major investment, and you can't just plant them somewhere and then decide where to put them two or three years later because you'll lose them. So, um, well, I think I think I think along those lines. I mean, five percent, ten percent, fifteen trees is what the upper. I mean, yeah. look, if we pick a number, I, I'm picking pick a number. Right. If we right. say fifteen trees, you know, as, as planted with the architect and the, the, the conjunction with the neighbors, that's fine with me. Yeah. I, I just see most of the trees are seven to eight foot in height. There are there are many, however, that are ten to twelve foot, and I'm just thinking in a general sense. An additional 15, 10 to 12 foot trees is only going to help. You know, right. and, and it will be a, a nod to the abutter. We're, we're doing what we can. We're doing what we're showing. We're going to go more over and above and, and plant some extra trees to do what we can. That's, that's my thought. In other words, you're just increasing the number of trees you exactly. have to put in. Yeah. But, it, but it's but increasing in the trees in conjunction so with well, the that's, yeah. that's the term, I guess. So you end up with. Whatever the number so is. not necessarily just one for, for the benefit of one abutter, but for the benefit of all the abutters, there might be 10 to 15 extra trees that right. could be dispersed. Right. Okay. Everybody gets four trees, then, then <laughs> put them where you want, however, however it works. I have room in my garden. You get some more providing for you. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> Young. I won't do that. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so the sidewalks. We still have the issue of the sidewalks. I think we've heard from the neighbors. They don't really want sidewalks on their side of the house, on their side of the street. Um, we've heard there was an idea, and I think Devin, you mentioned it's putting it on the other side of the street. Um, or the third option was yeah. you keep it in, in to, for, for traffic mitigation, specifically, I'm not sure if we have to identify Leonard Street, or the traffic mitigation money has to be used within the area around the project. Or just combine it with traffic mitigation. Well, that's what it would be. Yeah. Would be the money for the sidewalk would be combined with traffic mitigation money to be used in the neighborhood. In, for traffic. Well, I guess two things. You'd want to hear from the applicant about their thoughts about right. welcome that in. But I also want to clarify mm -hmm. that um, sidewalk requirements are a real requirement. And if applicant, if, if property owners don't like the, having sidewalks on their side, the board isn't. Um, doesn't have the jurisdiction to say, okay, we'll put it on somebody else's side. I think the issue really about thinking about the opposite side of Route 9 was the fact that there was already a sidewalk segment constructed on the, on the side where there is more neighborhood access. So I think it's not necessarily just swapping the sidewalk to the other side of the road for its own sake, but the, the rationale was that then you could maybe start making those links. So then the alternative to that even, you know, so you could go one way or the other, south towards the VA or north towards Haydenville, wherever there may be affinity paths already, um, or if the applicants are willing to look at addressing the intersection. And what, we, what the city doesn't want to do is just collect a whole bunch of money, preferably the applicant would be doing traffic mitigation, not just making a payment in the lot. So to the extent that we can get a real project out of it, fixing a problem intersection in that regard, that's much better. Brandon? Well, as a, as a matter of principle, I think every house, every resident should have a sidewalk. Uh, there are lots of places in the city that would be greatly improved with sidewalks. In certain places, they aren't suitable, or they aren't feasible. But I don't present a 
don't have anything against a uh, sidewalk or nowhere if there is a reasonable expectation that there will be something done later. And I, the fact that somebody has to shovel it is not clear. Well, I just think if, if, if there was a place near there that was more effective, to, that the sidewalk would be more effective to utilize. You know, there's two houses here. I mean, if you're on the other side of the street, or if there's a neighborhood close enough that we could get you know, a much better plan for the sidewalk, but I would be much more clear with you. I'm, I'm, I agree with you. I think uh, sidewalks are necessary. So, but I just I want to make sure it's in the right place. So, I'm not, I guess I'm, I'm not hearing a strong indication that it should be on the west side of the street. Carolyn, you seem, are, you, are you suggesting that we should put it on the west side of the street or um, the other side of the street? Yes. Well, I, I think uh, the opposite side of the project site, I think that it makes more sense if the sidewalk um, constru construction requirement is going to be met that it that the um, opposite side of the road makes sense because we've already started that link um, to get from the condominiums, the Beaverbrook condominiums, down to the neighborhood. So you can either um, require that that segment get continued because it is on the more densely populated side of Route 9. Um, but I think there is um, an equally um, beneficial argument to be made for making that pot of money bigger. Um, so who, who shovels it if it goes on that side? Well, the property owners, uh, by city ordinance, sidewalks in front of your property are your responsibility. So there's owners all along there. <coughs> what about talking to the applicant about the Meyer Street? Well, that's, so those are the two options. I guess that's that's really what we're, we have to decide, which are the, which are the two options. I mean, it, I, I, mean, I guess, from your perspective, representing the city, I guess, do you have a preference? Would you prefer the sidewalk or the Leonard Street intersection? Which one is going to have the bigger impact in that neighborhood? I think the Leonard Street intersection is going to have a bigger impact, and that's why I would lean in this situation, if the applicant were willing, more towards a solution that really helps both sides of Route 9 and, and really addresses um, impacts from project um, and given the fact that uh, there is not anything pending that I know of any Route 9 reconstruction in any near term um, that would then result in sidewalks all the way up to the you know, Street. And so are we okay then? We have to ask the applicant if they're willing to, no. instead of spending the money on the sidewalk, to spend the money traffic mitigation. Is that amenable to you guys? Okay, there are two nods. I'll take that as a yes. Uh, Alright, so I think the condition is going to be then the money that would have gone into putting the sidewalk in the, to the east side, we're going to have added to the traffic mitigation and we're going to target that money towards Leonard Street, the Leonard Street intersection. And did you note about the water? The irrigation? Yeah. Yeah, I think you have one. Um, any other issues? Um, should we move to close public comment? Is that? I move to close public comment. Second. Very good. Any discussion? All in favor? All right, so public comment's closed. So now we just have to decide. We have two permits in front of us. Uh, we can do them one at a time. You guys want to do the easy one first? Yeah. <coughs> And then I would just suggest that so special permit amendment to Linda Manor's special permit for the amendment. And then the other one would be special permit um, for the construction of the facility and site plan approval for the shared driveway. Yeah, I don't think we have the language in the agenda. No, no we don't. So um, I, I would like to do them separately because I would like to Oh no, we're gonna do no. We're gonna vote them. We're gonna vote them separately. We're just okay. the length. Yeah. It's just we have to make sure we have the language correct uh, for both. Of
we just need to get the language for the permit so we can vote on it. I move that we grant the special permit for expansion of Linda Manor by Chuck Close Investment LLC at 349 Edenville Road, map ID 655-637 and 639. Okay, so this is the special permit for the expansion of Linda Manor, the, the smaller of the two projects. Um, is there a second? Second. No, uh, any discussion on this one? All right, all in favor? So that was the smaller of the two. Uh, Fran? I move that we grant the special permit for the new three story nursing care assisted living facility at 349 Amazon Road by Apple Investment LLC. Map ID 655637 Is there a second? Second. For Marla? <coughs> do I read the do we should we read out the commission? Yeah. Yeah. Um site irrigation may not be tied to the public water system. Uh, landscape architects must be on site during the planting um, of the trees and um, trees, uh, uh, I'm sorry, let's, um, I'll leave that condition. It's not really in the right order, but <laughs> it's the way I wrote it down. Um, applicant must install fencing as shown on the plan or as otherwise agreed to uh, and between the abutters and the applicants. You guys didn't come back around and talk about that, but I just noted it from early on the discussion. So can, there was a discussion about that. Um, Bus shelter shall be located as shown on plans unless otherwise um, required by PBTA. Um, <coughs> the buffer shall be uh, to be maintained shall be flagged and temporary fencing along the um, tree shall be noted for tree protection during construction. Ten. Now, this I don't have the number clear from what from your conversation. Ten or fifteen additional trees. It was fifteen. Okay. One shrubbery. Um, ten additional um, evergreen. Fifteen. Or fifteen additional evergreen um, trees shall be placed in consultation. Um, between the abutters and the landscape architect as needed. Uh, the sidewalk, as offered by the applicant, uh, funding for sidewalk construction shall be put towards uh, traffic mitigation um, for Leonard Street intersection design changes. <coughs> I, I don't I don't think we ought to require the landscape architect to be there during the planting of the trees, but to supervise the location of the planting of the trees. Well, I think yeah. the concern was, yeah, yeah they offered it. I, mean, I just, I mean, I just don't think it should have to be there all day, every day. So. But it's during the planting, so but if they offered it, I'm willing to accept it. Okay. So, yeah. No, I was going to say I've, I've seen planting done when the LA isn't there, and it's it can be horrific. Did you send the maintenance? Yeah, that's another one. So, 
so, um, let's see. Was, it, was that the hours of operation? The, the maintenance yeah. plan for those. Um, you said it really nice yeah. a few minutes ago. Um, prior to planting, the applicant um, shall submit um, a watering and maintenance schedule um, for the first two years. Uh, and the hours of operation mark, we said were controlled by zoning. So yeah. they just, yeah, they have to make sure that they're adhering to the zoning for the hours of operation. Anybody? Other ones? Do we have to say anything about the lighting? Uh, so it's added on the plans. Plan. Okay. They have to build what they show on the plan. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments? Um, all right, so we have a motion, second, conditions. Any further discussion? All right, uh, all in favor? Six, all opposed? Two. Oh, right. So it passes. Thank you. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. 